Have you ever eaten at a smorgasbord? It could be a, a breakfast or brunch or lunch or dinner buffet. I remember when my father was living, he died a few years ago, he used to love to take our family to a hometown buffet on Hall Boulevard. And our kids, I remember seven or eight kids running around. It was the only time they could eat all this stuff where we just kind of let them go. And they're just back and forth. And One all-you-can-eat place uh, kicked out a basketball player after he went back for his 10th plate. <laughs> but when you go to a smorgasbord, you have to be uh, a little bit discerning. You have to be somewhat discriminating. You don't want to eat something that's been sitting there for six days. The kind of, board, kind of smorgasbord I'm talking about today goes way beyond food. Some of the most dangerous smorgasbords today, in fact, are theological. There are all kinds of things people believe today, and not all are true or good. Some people don't know what they're talking about. A shepherd was watching his flock in a remote area when a brand new Land Rover advanced out of the dust and a young man got out of it with his hair slicked back, a brand new silk suit, Gucci shoes, Ray-Ban sunglasses, a gold Rolex watch. And he said to the shepherd, if I tell you exactly how many sheep you have, will you give me one of them? He stared at him and he said, okay. So the guy pulled out his computer and plugged in his cell phone and and surf to an internet, you know, global positioning site, had to scan the whole area, and then he pulled down an Excel spreadsheet with complex formula, then he printed it off from his miniature printer on his dashboard. He said, you have exactly 1,586 sheep. And the shepherd looked at him and he said, man, you're right. All right, then... Uh, Take one of the sheep. And so he watched as this yuppie <clears throat> took one of his animals and packed it into the back of his Land Rover. Then the shepherd said to him, if I tell you what kind of business you're in, will you give me my animal back? The guy said, well, okay. He says, you're a consultant. He says, you're right. How'd you know that? Well, you show up in your fancy suit and all your high-tech gear and... Uh, you know, you consult people about stuff, but you don't know anything about the stuff. You don't know squat about sheep. He says, why do you say that? Well, that sheep you put in the back of your Land Rover was my lead shepherd dog. <laughs> he said, you don't know squat about sheep. There's people that don't know really what they're teaching about. This is the fourth in our series of messages called The Real Thing. We're talking about what is the real thing when it comes to following Christ. What does it really mean to be a Christian? And John, one of Jesus' disciples, writes a book called 1 John to answer this question. Turn to 1 John. It's in the back of the Bible, just before Revelation. And the thing I love about what John does is he simplifies the real thing about Christian faith to three things. We can keep track of three. The real thing, he says, is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. And it's not just that you do one of these. You do all three of these in balance. I mean, some people are really good at loving people, but they don't know what they believe and they don't care about standards there. You have to have all three, John says. So today I want to look at what does a real Christ follower believe. The real thing is to believe Jesus. Uh, John answers this question in 1 John 2, 18 to 27. Uh, so I'm going to read this, and as I do, I want you to look for key words. If you're studying the Bible on your own and you're reading a section, you kind of want to, okay, what's this about? You want to look for key words, and one way to look for key words are ones that are repeated. So I find Antichrist three times, lies three times, truth three times, the word remains three times, anointing four times, G, uh, Father, God the Father is four times, and Jesus is mentioned six times. So let's stand in honor of God's word. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. 
This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is a key line here. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Lord Jesus, be our teacher today. You taught John. He wrote this book. Through him, would you teach us what we believe, what we should believe, and we're ready to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to ask four questions of these verses I just read. What do we not believe? What do we believe? What prevents us from believing? And how does Jesus help us believe? So what do we not believe? If there are right things to believe, then that means there are some things that are not right to believe that we are to avoid. What are some of these false beliefs we face today? John starts out, dear John, this is the last hour. He said this 2,000 years ago. What's he talking about? The Bible uh, uh, outlines eras of time, and since Christ came and died and rose again, that marks the, be the beginning of the last era. So it's the beginning of the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, John teaches that before Christ returns, an Antichrist will rise up who will coalesce more people, more nations against Christ than at any other time in history. This is, uh, and even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. He says there's not just one Antichrist, but anyone who is against Christ represents an Antichrist. And he says the more you see, the more deception is taught, uh, the more Antichrists that rise up, you know it's closer to the time when Christ is returning. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would not they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Some of the people that were against Christ actually had started out in the church and had gone out from the church. But John says that shows they really weren't true believers. So what are some of the false uh, beliefs that uh, we face today? One is that Jesus was only a good moral teacher. John writes, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Some people deny that Jesus is the Son of God. They say, he was only a great moral teacher. I believe in his teaching, marvelous stuff, but I don't believe he was God. I, I don't believe he was born of a virgin. That's a, come on. I don't believe that he did all those miracles. The church made those up after he died. I certainly don't believe in the the resurrection, that's preposterous. But I believe he was a great moral teacher. But I don't believe he was the son of God. Yet, Jesus, when he was asked at his trial, are you the son of God, said, I am. And he said, whoever's seen me has seen the Father. I and my Father are one. He clearly taught that he was God. He was the son of God. He was fully God. Well, he can't be a great moral teacher if he's teaching the Son of God when he's really not. You with me? That would make him like a liar or a, a fake. So that option really isn't open to people to say that Jesus was just a great moral teacher. He was, if he is that, he is much, much more than that. Another uh, false teaching we hear today is all religious beliefs lead to God. We live in an age of undiscriminating belief. Uh, you that are in uh, middle school or high school, you are taught that we are to respect all beliefs. 
And actually, our Constitution uh, uh, teaches that we are to respect all people's belief. You can worship the way you want to in this country. But what's often taught with that is a corollary that says all beliefs are equally valid. All of them lead to God. John says, no, no. Verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. You can't deny Jesus Christ is the Son of God and still worship the Father. Can't do it. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. People often assume that religious beliefs lie beyond the rules of logic. Any belief is as good as another. We're free to believe whatever we want. If there are many ways to God, then God sacrificed his son for no good reason. Why send his son to the excruciating death on a cross if there are many other perfectly good ways to reconcile sinful human beings with a holy God? So what do we believe? What does John teach a real Christ follower believes? Two things. One, he believes that Jesus is fully God. Verse 22, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. The liar denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. We believe Jesus is fully God. Erwin Lutzer, pastor of Moody uh, Bible Church in Chicago, one of the largest churches in Chicago, also famous church, it was founded by Dwight L. Moody, took his family to China, and he was hosted by Bishop Ding, who was the head of the church, the official church in China. So Lutzer asked him questions about how, you know, how's the church going in China, and you know, what about freedom to you know, preach as they want, and, and, and then the sensitive question of the underground church. Many uh, Chinese Christians are, you know, they, they stay underground. They don't want to be monitored by the official church and the Communist Party. And, and they didn't know if Bishop Ding was a Christian. After all, he's walking the fine line of trying to oversee the official church, churches, but also please the Communist Party. So where did he stand? Well, He made that clear toward the end of their visit when he said, you know, I know who you evangelicals are. Evangelical means uh, people who believe the Bible is true and you can build your life on it. He says, I know who you are and you will find people like you all over China. Because when the cultural revolution came, wiping out all the Bibles and persecuting and killing many Christians, all the theological liberals in our country vanished. And that makes sense. As Lutzer thought about it, of course. Why would a theological liberal who doesn't believe Jesus is the Son of God, doesn't believe he rose from the dead, why would he be willing to be persecuted and killed for a purely human Jesus? So we believe Jesus is fully God. He had to be fully God to provide an infinite, holy sacrifice acceptable to God. We also believe Jesus was fully human. The Corinthians, who were leading people astray, taught that God cannot live in an evil body, and all human bodies are evil. All matter is evil, so God couldn't house himself in a human body. Therefore, Jesus had to be fully only human. But John says, no. First verse of the book, that which was from the beginning, talking about Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. He says, no, no, he was fully God, yes, but he was also fully human. We touched him. We listened to him. We saw him. Chapter 4, verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh, that he was human, is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. The writer to the Hebrews says, for this reason, he, Jesus, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus is fully God, but he also had to be fully human if he was to represent us to God and die for human sin. One of the reasons I 
would encourage you, if you've never come to a starting point class that we're having tonight, is because we will talk about what we believe as a church. And I want to talk with you about how you can grow in your faith. Now, some people shy away from a class that they know is leading to membership because they're afraid the pastor's going to ask for more than they want to give. This, is, this class is not about me asking you anything. I want to serve you well, help you wherever you are grow to the next step in your faith. What prevents us from believing? If one of the marks of the real thing is having right belief, then we have to know what we believe. That means we have to study. We have to read the Bible. We have to, to know what it is. But many followers of Christ don't have a clue what they believe. What prevents us from studying and learning our faith? Well, John says in 2.18, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Verse 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. One thing that prevents us is people that are leading us astray. And John would suggest behind um, many of these people are the elemental spirits of the world, the demonic forces. There is a spiritual battle for you going on in this world. And the spiritual forces of evil want to keep you from Christ. So that prevents us. Another thing might be you, you say, I'm just too busy. I don't have time to read the Bible. If you see, knew everything I do during a week, you'd understand. Or maybe you say, when I sit down and read the Bible, I'm so exhausted, I just, I fall asleep. Or I sit down to read the Bible and I don't know what to read. I read a little bit here, a little bit there, and after a few days I just kind of figure, why bother? Or you say, I don't understand what I read. Middle schooler, high schooler, you sit down and you read and you say, I don't understand a lot of that. How does Jesus help us believe? I've got great news for you. Jesus provides us with the anointing of the Holy Spirit to teach us everything we need to know. 1 John 2.20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him, the Holy Spirit, remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Isn't that great news? If you have committed your life to Christ, he gave his Holy Spirit to dwell in you. You sit down to read the Bible and the master teacher who inspired the writing, all the authors of the scripture, is right there with you to teach you what it means. This is why it's so critical when you sit down to read the Bible or you open up the journal, you always pray first. Don't just dive in. You say, God, by your Holy Spirit, would you help me understand what I read today? Sometimes I don't understand it. Would you help me stay awake? Sometimes I fall asleep. Would you help me, um, you know, just focus for 15 minutes? And then you begin. And you have the master teacher with you. You don't need Pastor Ron. You don't need some great teacher with you. The Holy Spirit is there with you. Maybe another thing that prevents us from knowing what we believe is a lack of motivation. You say, you know, quite frankly, I'm not too motivated to read the Bible. It's not too exciting. You can ask the Holy Spirit to motivate you. I went to Chicago for graduate school to become a pastor, and I took 15 hours every quarter and, you know, they say you should study 30 hours or two hours for every class. So I had 45 hours of school going. Then I worked in uh, Young Life, and I spent 25 hours a week doing Young Life. That's 70 hours. Add to that just the stuff you need to live, like sleeping and eating and working out. And I didn't have any time for dating. Then Jory walked into my life. What happened? All of a sudden, I had time for late-night phone calls. I had time for study breaks, going over to her house. I had time for dates and thinking of fun stuff to do. It was a joy. It, 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 I found all kinds of time, all kinds of motivation. And the Holy Spirit will do the same thing for you when it comes to the Bible. He'll motivate you. He knows how important it is that you understand God and you understand his word. He'll motivate you. And I'll tell you, right now, one of the first things I do every morning is spend time with Christ. 
I don't do it long because I want it to be a sustainable amount of time, uh, but I look forward to that. It's one of my favorite times of the day, a little bit of time in his word. The Holy Spirit helps us understand the Bible, and the Holy Spirit also works on people who, do not, who are not followers of Christ, who may not know Christ, but he's working on them to guide them, lead them to Christ. He might use miracles, might use dreams, might use visions. Come on up, up here, Bill and Mamie. I'd like you to meet Bill and Mamie Douglas. They got married here December 12th in our church. They had a beautiful wedding, beautiful couple. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting with them in premarital counseling. And one of the questions I always ask a couple is, well, tell me about yourself spiritually. What's your story? And uh, I just want to know. And, uh, and so I asked them, and I was fascinated by your story, Mamie, of how God led you to Christ. And so, so I'd like you to share with them. So, so Amy told me how she grew up in China and uh, really was a very non-religious upbringing, Buddhism, little Chinese folk religion. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I grew up in China in a, a village in Guangdong, China. That village is about... Is that on? No. Keep going. You just keep talking. They'll catch you. Uh, uh, I born at Guangdong, China, a smaller village. The village is about 300 people, and uh, there is uh, uh, no indoor uh, water and have the outdoor bathroom as well. And, uh, Chuck. and our religion is we only um, we only worship uh, about worship the ancestors and lots of the idols. And we do not have a specific uh, uh, religion. When uh, people uh, have sick at home, then they ask another uh, Buddha for help and for peace. And, and if it, you uh, need the money, then they go for the ask for the wealth, uh, the Buddha with the big berry, provide you wealth. Okay, so basically a very non-religious upbringing in yes. China. All right, then how did the Holy Spirit lead you to Christ? First thing you told me was about your grandmother and talking to you about the Bible. But Bibles were not uh, yeah. dangerous stuff in China. Yeah, there is a, there's a, we cannot have a religion in China at that time. And uh, I remember when I was little, uh, my grandma mentioned a secret book to me and but we cannot own it and cannot have it and cannot mention it. If we do and somebody would report it, then we would in jail. So at uh, that moment when my grandma told me the secret book is that when people are sick, you are not happy and then all you need is to read the books and believe in one person. Then you will be healed and what then what? If it's so powerful, we just go get the book. We just, my grandma said, we cannot get the book. No, that book, a long time ago, we cannot have it, cannot own one. Books don't have it. So, this, so yeah. Then, and my grandma, see, I start, you know, and make the voice louder and try to, to prevent that somebody, you know, report this something about, we talk about that. Then my grandma said, okay, okay, stop. Not, we cannot talk anymore. And we will tell you more when you older. All right. So then when you were 25, you uh, came to the United States. You went to Portland State. You got involved in the international uh, student Christian thing there. And, but I'm particularly interested in uh, three visions you had or dreams uh, where uh, the Holy Spirit was leading you. So tell us about the first one. Uh, the first vision after I came to the U.S., so I shop. Uh, prepare and went back to China to visit my parents and brothers. So I shop for my mom. I, I see a coat, the red color one, is good, have the hood, perfect for China, for that my hometown at the winter, raining time all the time. Then I love the coat, I pick it up, but suddenly there's a, in, my, in front of me is all this blood, all this blood, there's a, I don't know how much, all it is red and blood only. Then I was so scared Then I consider it's not luck. And lucky, you know, that I throw that, uh, the, jack, the coat back to the shell and the rock then. But I just think about it is uh, the middle of the day, sunshine outside, the evil, we cannot walk at that moment. There is soon be this evil thing. Yeah. Then but I think it might be some stress only. Then I still bought that coat for my mom. 
All right, so you go out this coat and you saw a vision of the coat being all bloody. Now, what was the second vision you saw? The uh, second one is uh, about uh, six months before my mom uh, gone, go, uh, passed away. And that was at uh, July, at about, uh, the, about one month we moved to, Orle to Poland from Beaverton, Southeast Poland. Then we joined a uh, uh, city uh, mayor's invitation for a picnic. Each year we, ha we have one. Then we knew to the neighborhood here at Beaverton, we want to know our neighbor neighborhood and we know more people and we want to join, participate in the community. Then and, uh, we walk across the street to a little park for that picnic party. Then when we walk back home with my mom, then at the middle of the road, I suddenly I see the vision, this all is blood again, just like a river, cover the whole earth. That is all around this blood. I was so scared, I think in that moment, I, said, I have some terrible thing happened to me. Then, but I feel, I have feeling, then I pump my heart, oh, I'm, here, oh mom, mom, then my mom is next by me, nothing happened, okay, then, so okay, stress, then go home, then forget it, and six months later, my mom uh, was in the, uh, when he crossed, when her crossing the street to the bus stop, and she was struck by a, a car, and end up there's three cars, three cars passed over her body, and my mom wear the coat, when I bought it for her, when I vision have blood, and at the same blood, I have vision, lots of blood that like the liver covered the whole earth. All right, so God showed you ahead of time how your mom would die, and you're beginning to realize this is supernatural. Now, tell me about the third vision. The third vision, you saw yourself in a Chinese Bible study at, I think, at Village Church, where you ultimately became a Christian. Uh, before that, I uh, went to the temple and the, uh, pa the master told me to go to church. Yeah. Then and I came to the church. Uh, before that, I, before I came to the church, but I have a dream about and, see, and have the books. Okay, the record books they have lots of names in it, you know. And, but I didn't know what is it, but there's lots of uh, pages by pages, uh, very fast but just do not have my family's name in that. So I was, but I know there's something wrong, not good, our name's not there. Then I was, uh, why we do not, our name's not there? We are really good, we are good people. Then, but I don't know what is it. That time I still don't know about Bible. Then I just, it's a dream only, then over. Then when I went to the Bible study and- So your, book, uh, your names weren't in the Book of Life. Is that, what I, is that what you just said? In the dream? In the dream, just yeah. not the physical book, but yeah. I know just like a monitor, like the big skin, the name is pages, pages, very okay. fast. They try to see our name or my family's name, they are not there, right. not over there, okay. I didn't know what is it. Then and when I was in the Bible study with the uh, passage uh, Chin, the Chinese pastor in the group's Bible study. Then and, uh, we talk about the people question a lot about uh, how God and uh, know we a real question. How could, how God will know we, uh, uh, we are in the belief we being saved or not. Then the pastor Chin's wife, the, hold on here. Then she lead us to one chapter, uh, some uh, phrase. Then she said, Let's read it together. Then when I read it about that, about the how God required all the real questions and them in there, then when I read the phrases, then I suddenly remember my dream. Oh my goodness, that dream, God already told me we, how he is recording who is the real question. That's the name is there, the God required everything. Then at that moment, when I was studying the Bible, I, I wanted to know, that is the dream about, that is my mission to put, to uh, tell my family and tell the people and responsible to get my uh, family. Right now, that's my nephews here to come to the church all the time with me. So I, yeah, I know that is, uh, God is so real, so true in my life. God saved me so many times. When I have time, I'm happy to share with you more impersonally. All right, isn't that a great story? Huh?
All right. So now Bill comes along. So, uh, uh, Bill, uh, tell us how you became a Christian. Well, before I start talking about myself, uh, I just want to tell everybody what an inspiration Mamie's been in my life. And I really do encourage you to visit with her and ask her more. It's amazing how far she's come from a 300-person village, a farming village in China, to Beaverton, uh, and here sitting at this wonderful uh, building. Well, anyway, in answer to your question, uh, Pastor Ron, um, I grew up as a Catholic, and um, most of you probably know Catholic uh, religion is pretty strict. Uh, they have some beliefs uh, which are pretty dogmatic. Um, however, I did receive a pretty good foundation in Jesus Christ and the Bible. Uh, from the time you're young, you're taught to read the Bible and taught in school, and so I had a good foundation. But when I went to college, I fell away from the church. Um, I think because the Catholic Church uh, and its dogmas, I just couldn't buy into the whole thing. Um, but after that, um, a funny thing happened. Uh, Stan Tellen, who's one of the frequent members of the church here, uh, he and I became friends. And uh, he invited us to a um, Easter service. Uh, when this church uh, worshipped in a uh, Whitford. Gym Whitford gymnasium, yep. and uh, and I attended that with a few of our other friends, but mainly did it to uh, satisfy Stan. But I think uh, I'm just being honest here. Um, this was the seed that was planted, though. Um, so I'm sure that Stan, you know, at the time thought, well, I didn't have any impact, but he did. Uh, he planted the seed. Um, later on, uh, as uh, I met Mamie, uh, I was drawn closer to the church. I started attending Bible study with Mamie and uh, met uh, it's another... It's in Chinese? What? Sorry? The Bible study's in Chinese? Uh, as a matter of fact, it was. I bet yes. you got a lot out of that. Uh, but <laughs> as, as most of you probably have heard before, communication is 20% uh, verbal and 80% body language and gestures and tones and other things. So I was pretty much able to follow and even contribute. Um, but anyway, um, Pastor Chin, who also participated in our wedding ceremony here, uh, he brought me closer to Jesus by actually uh, reading some verses and uh, talking about Jesus, and it brought Jesus back into my life. Uh, then when we were looking for a place to get married, um, we had originally planned to get married in an auditorium in my office building. Um, but um, we checked around, and I mentioned to Stan, my friend, who originally brought me to this church, um, you know, we're going to get married in the auditorium. I hope you can make it. And he said, well, why don't you check with Pastor Ron? And, uh, and so I did, and uh, the church was available, and we had a beautiful wedding. You might see some of the pictures flash by. Uh, but as part of that, I got to meet Pastor Ron. And uh, through Pastor Ron's uh, premarital counseling and uh, a book that he asked me to read, uh, I was able to uh, reintroduce Christ into my life. Um, I have to say, you know, when I was in this dry period uh, in between college and now, uh, I still had uh, the idea that um, I should do good works and treat other people with love and that I should obey, at least I should be a good person. But I think the belief part was totally missing, and uh, I really thank uh, Pastor Ron for bringing me back to Jesus Christ. And now um, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, um, everything. Thank you for asking. All right. Bill and Mamie, <clears throat> thank you. So Jesus provides us with the Holy Spirit who will guide us to himself. Help us understand the Bible, and all we have to do is remain in him. John says, as for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. So, what is the real thing in following Christ? The real thing is to believe Jesus. We believe Jesus is fully God. We believe Jesus is fully human. And we believe the Holy Spirit is real and that he guides us to Christ and helps us understand everything we need to know to follow him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, teaching us today. We thank you for John, what he learned from Jesus and teaching us. And uh, we uh, are so grateful for it being made real clear what it is we believe. 
want to give you an opportunity to express your belief to Christ right now. Uh, if you've never given your life to Christ, you could invite him in. The Holy Spirit will come at that point into your life and uh, tell him if you believe this, that you believe he's fully God and he's fully human and uh, thank him for being your Savior and ask him to help you by his Holy Spirit to understand his word. You pray. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers, Lord Jesus, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would you